out on our trails, which I highly recommend doing. One, bring a lot of water because it's hot. But two, don't go out there expecting to find tracks because they're all within the confines of the river here. The river is what exposed these tracks to us, and the river is what is eventually going to take these tracks away. Right? But enough about that. What are we here for? We're here for dinosaur tracks, right? Yeah. So, here in the main track site, can anyone find something that looks like a dinosaur track? Point it out to me. Like right there? With the right there, yeah. right there, 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 right there. Come over there, come over there. You way down there. I can notice that that one right there is kind of web. Oh, nice. Nice. So all, almost all of these impressions right here in this area are dinosaur tracks. Almost every single one. Look in there and find me a track that has got three big toes on it. Point that it out. Just right point there. it out to right me. There. Right, right there. Right there. Oh, there's a few right here. Let me get over on this smaller rock. I get a closer, closer to them and point to them a little better. So we've got one right here, right? We've got one right here, right here, 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 right here, right here, right here, right over there, a couple down there. There's a few, right? There's a few. So each one of these dinosaur tracks has got the three giant claws on them, three giant toes, belongs to the same type of dinosaur. Maybe not the same individual, but the same type. Anyone have a guess as to what that dinosaur might be? Yes, sir. Um, I would assume either a Gigantosaurus or something like that. Gigantosaurus? Yes, sir, in the red. A Tyrannosaurus. A Tyrannosaurus? A Tyrannosaurus. Same as his. Same as his? Well, very similar to these dinosaurs. Very, very similar. Same Let's think of Tyrannosaurus Rex. Are we all familiar with T-Rex? Yeah. Okay. So how many legs does T-Rex stand on? Two. Two. He's five feet, right? So is the dinosaur that made these tracks. Stands on two legs. You can see a left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot's way out there. So it stands on two legs. What does T-Rex eat? Meat. Meat. So if you just eat meat, you're a carnivore, right? So is Acrocanthosaurus. In fact, Acrocanthosaurus wasn't just any carnivore. He, like T-Rex, was an apex predator. What does it mean to be an apex predator? You're the most scared predator. You're the top of the food chain, right? You don't really have to worry about being eaten by too many other dinosaurs. Because you're big, you're, you're meat eater, and everyone else is looking out for, for you. Because they won't be eaten by you, right? Just like T-Rex, Acrocanthosaurus, a dinosaur that makes power footprints, was an apex predator. So it stands on two legs, they eat the same type of food. What about the body shape of T Rex? Um, yeah. Stands on two legs. Very long tail. Long tail, right? So he, he kind of stands on two legs, balancing out with his big tail and his big old massive head. What about his leg or his arm? Are they long or are they short? They're short, right? So T Rex has two old claws, Acrocanthosaurus has Three. Yeah. I can't source scared. He is a scary dinosaur. I wouldn't want to meet him face to face. <laughs> Absolutely not. So, like T Rex, Acrocanthosaurus stands on two legs, carnivorous dinosaur, great big old head, big tail to balance him out, and tiny little short arms, right? Unlike T Rex and Acrocanthosaurus, unlike T Rex, Acrocanthosaurus lived at a different time period. A lot of times we like to think of the dinosaurs that we know all living at the same time and interacting with each other. But there was hundreds and hundreds of millions between these two or between all the dinosaurs. Between T-Rex and Acrocanthosaurus, there's about 50 million years. T-Rex died out at the end of the Cretaceous, about 65 million years ago. Acrocanthosaurus, the dinosaur making these footprints, was around 113 million years ago. So there's about as much time between us and T-Rex as there is between T-Rex and Acrocanthosaurus. Huge, huge space. 
Acrocanthosaurus was a little bit smaller than T-Rex. Pretty big. Acrocanthosaurus, when he's standing up in a natural state, is about 15 feet high at his hip right there. And we can reach up to 20 feet tall. That's as tall as a two-story building. How many of y'all play basketball? Anybody? Anybody know what regulation basketball goal height is? Oh, well, let's drop down a little bit more. A little bit more. Four more. <coughs> ten or ten feet. So you think about basketball goal at the park or at school, if it's regulation, it's ten foot tall. So take that, double it, and you get the maximum height of Afrocanthosaurus. He, he wasn't light either. He weighed up to seven tons. He was a little smaller than a T-Rex. T-Rex would have been about probably five feet taller at the hip. Five to ten feet taller maybe at the hip than Acrocanthosaurus. So they're roughly the same size, but Acrocanthosaurus is a little bit smaller than, than T-Rex there. Uh, weighing up to seven tons. So how many of us know how many pounds are in one ton? Two thousand. Two thousand pounds to one ton. So if he weighs seven tons, how many pounds does Acrocanthosaurus weigh? Fourteen thousand. Fourteen thousand pounds. Fourteen thousand pounds. That's, a, that's as much as a small tank. He weighs as much as a small tank. Fourteen thousand. What? What's that? More, oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. That's a, that's a couple elephants right there. Mm -hmm. And here you can see his footprints. Again, you can see left foot, right foot, left foot. And then that fourth one out there kind of tears out. All you can make out is the very outermost digits of that foot. How come? Weathering away? Well, weathering does take place. And you can see... Here, you've got some tracks that are really nice. Sorry, I'll get it for you, bud. You can see some tracks that are really nice and deep, and then you see some tracks oh, that uh, are a little more worn away than others, right? So, I mentioned that all of these tracks with the three giant toes, you're welcome, belong to the same type of dinosaur, right? But do all of these no. tracks look exactly the same? No. Oh! What is? More dinosaurs, right? So maybe different individuals, right? If we all pull all shoes and socks off and compare our feet, we're all going to have roughly the same shape foot, right? We're going to have a heel and a ball and then five, give or take, toes on each foot, right? Some more, some less. But overall, similar shape. But the size is going to be different, right? If I compare my foot with your foot, who's going to have the bigger foot? Probably me, right? So different individuals have different size feet and a little variation of their feet. So it could be different individuals walking around here. What's another way that you can get a different type of footprint? <laughs> your type of locomotion, right? Whether I'm walking in a nice straight line at a slow, steady pace, I'm probably gonna make some nice tracks. What about when I start to run, though? Could be messed up, right? Because I'm kicking up dirt. Uh, my pace between the steps is gonna be further apart. What if I decide to turn? Look at this foot. It steps in the mud and then it turns. What is it going to do to that track? It's going to smear it, right? So different types of locomotion, different types of individuals are going to give you different variations of the track that we've got. We've got one more key reason for the different types of tracks that you see here, even though they're made by the same type of dinosaur, maybe even the exact same dinosaur. How many of us have ever stepped in mud? We all, have we all stepped in a mud puddle? Is yep. every single mud puddle that you step in the exact same? No. no, right? Sometimes the mud is pretty hard and firm, right? And you step on it and then walk away. Maybe you got a little mud in your shoes at the time. Sometimes that mud is really soupy. 
and you step in it, you know, your foot squishes down, and then it like sucks your shoe off as you try to pull it out. How many of us think that happens to you? So different types of mud, different consistencies of mud are going to give you different types of tracks. Hey guys, let's try to keep all the rocks from the, the pool so it makes the ripples, okay? All right, so if we look over at this particular track, this is a really nice track. This is one of my favorite Acro Kansasaurus tracks that we have. One, it's a big track, so it's from a bigger individual, but it's got a lot of detail to it. You can make out not all three of his toes, but all five of Acro Kansasaurus's toes. You can see toe one, two, three in the front, right? And then in the back, I can see a fourth toe right here. How many of us have ever seen a chicken? So think about the last time you saw a chicken, its foot, and then that claw pointing backwards on the chicken's foot. That's essentially the th same thing that you're seeing right here on Acrocanthosaurus's footprint. How many claws is that total right now? I'm at four. So where's that fifth claw? It's on, it's like a little bit past the first one. A little bit past the first one? What if I told you it was right there? That's the one I was talking about. That's the one? Awesome. So imagine my foot is at, or my legs Acrocanthosaurus. I've got my three claws up here, my fourth one in the back, and then on the inside and raised up a little bit, I've got my fifth claw right there. Anybody have a dog with a dew claw? Yeah, it's that claw on the inside of the back leg that kind of kind of dangles now. It's vestigial for, for dogs, meaning evolutionarily, evolutionarily there, but doesn't really have a lot of purpose left, right? For Acrocanthosaurus, he was very much using that claw to help scrape at his food or help gain traction as it's walking, right? So this footprint right here holds a lot of shape and a lot of detail. That's because the mud consistency back then, when this was still mud, was really nice and firm. But if we move over just a few feet and we look at this track right here, the mud consistency when the Acrocanthosaurus stepped in there was a lot different. It was a lot soupier. You can see this crack right here. That's where the animal's toe went up underneath the mud, which is now rock, and then it pulled its foot out. This middle toe right here, y'all, I can stick my entire hand in that toe up to my watch band. That's how far back that toe goes underneath the rock. It goes back all the way to about right here. So it's deceiving, right? If you were to just look at this track and compare it to that track, which would you say is the obviously the bigger dinosaur? That Probably that one. Absolutely. That's what my mind would go to as well. But when I get down there and I measure, I put my hand in the center toe of that track as well. How far does it go back to? It goes back to my watch band. It's the same size footprint, this one, as this one. But the different consistencies of mud, back when this was still mud, give you a rise to different types of footprints. So the different individuals, different types of locomotion, different types of consistency of mud, all give you a different variation of the track that you're seeing here at the park. Anybody remember what this, what this track was made by? What kind of dinosaur the three toe tracks in here was made by? There's no trail on it. all in the woods. Starts with an A. Acro... Acrocanthosaurus. Acrocanthosaurus. Nice. Good job. How tall is Acrocanthosaurus? Uh, 20 feet max. Uh, 220 feet tall, right? How tall at his hip? 15 feet. How much did Acrocanthosaurus weigh? I forgot. 14,000 pounds. Now that's huge, right? That's huge. Well, what if I told you the next dinosaur just pales to compare, or Acrocanthosaurus, I should say, pales to compare well, to the next dinosaur? It wouldn't be a good idea to go. Yeah? Well, let's take a look. We'll go back to that really nice Acrocanthosaurus track that we were looking at right here. Just next to it right here, this is the back footprint, the back right foot to be exact, of Sora Poseidon. That is a 60 foot tall, 44 ton dinosaur. Huge, right? 
Anybody been on the sixth floor of a building? Yeah. Okay, so think about the last time you were on the sixth floor. Go look out the window and imagine Sword Poseidon looking straight at you. That's how tall Sword Poseidon was. Six story tall dinosaur. And not Sword Poseidon, it's Sora from Kraken. Oh. Interesting. Okay. For, oh, for Kraken? I got it. Yeah, because he's huge. <laughs> it's just a dumb joke. Well, sort of right here. This is, again, his back right foot. You can see right over here in the front where the claws dug into what was then mud. And this is his front foot. So the front foot and the back foot look pretty different, right? There's a lot more surface area on that back foot than the front foot. Why? Who was Sora beside I already mentioned he's a 60 foot tall, 44 ton dinosaur. But what did that body shape look like? Do you know? Long neck. Long neck, exactly. How many of us are familiar with Brontosaurus? Brachiosaurus. Right? Brachiosaurus is way old. Brontosaurus never existed. Oh, right. Brachio Brontosaurus goes in and out of existence. Interesting. Do you have a question on that? We'll, I'll touch back on it. But Brachiosaurus. This is a lot more similar to Sora Poseidon. So how many legs does Brachiosaur stand on? Four. Four, right? So does Sora Poseidon. You got back foot here, front foot here, that's two. Back foot here, and again, another back foot right up in here. Now how come this back foot looks all crazy and wonky? Because he was turning. Could have been soupy? Could have been what? He could have been turning. Could have been turning, right? You also see another Acrocanthosaurus footprint right here that steps partially in that Sora Poseidon footprint. So when another individual steps in your footprint, that kind of messes up your footprint, right? All of those, all of those features that we just discussed attribute to that kind of weird amorphous hole in there that's really hard to distinguish as opposed to a really nice track right here. But you've got the right side of the individual and the left side right here coming in. So, stands on four foot, really long neck, long tail to help balance them out. What does Sora Poseidon eat? Plants or animals? Plants. Plants, Plants exactly. He, he is, he and she are our herbivores in the area, right? Most meat eating caught, most carnivores in the dinosaur time were standing on two legs. Interesting, interesting. Well, that definitely holds true here at the main track site with Acrocanthosaurus and Sora Poseidon right in here. Y'all have any questions so far on the dinosaurs that we've talked about? I, I'm yes, still sir. curious about Brontosaurus. You're curious about the Brontosaurus? Why it goes in and out of being a dinosaur? Yeah. So Brontosaurus was uh, an early discoverer of paleontology. When they found Brontosaurus, what they were finding were a bunch of different bones from different sauropods. So a sauropod is the type of dinosaur, like Sora Poseidon is, yeah. like Brontosaurus is. So they all stand on four legs, real long neck, long tail, herbivorous dinosaurs. They're all generically sauropods. So what scientists were finding were different sauropods and piecing them together and then calling it Brontosaurus. <laughs> so after a you know, at first, Brontosaurus was a dinosaur. In fact, we've got a statue of Brontosaurus up by the park store. But Brontosaurus went out of being a dinosaur after other paleontologists argued that he's just an amalgamation of these dinosaurs and therefore not a true spe specimen. Well, later on, and this is what science does, someone comes out with one claim and then another person does their study and comes out with another claim. Well, the other claim was, well, Brontosaurus is actually a dinosaur because he's got the majority of the bones on this specimen and it's the holotype of other dinosaurs. So he is a dinosaur for reasons like that. But then again, someone will come back and argue, well, no, no, it's just an amalgamation. So it's kind of a back and forth where Brontosaurus, I say, goes in and out of being an actual dinosaur. But you're absolutely right. Brontosaurus is just an amalgamation of dinosaur, of different sauropod bones all stuck together and called one dinosaur. It's like if you would have taken cow bones and uh, buffalo bones, maybe sprinkle it in some deer bones in there too, and you're like, ah, here's a Kadir. A <laughs> Kadir. <laughs> That's Brontosaurus. Good question. Good question. Any other questions about the dinosaurs that we've got here? Yes, sir. Um, was the um, 
uh, first one you talked about, uh, what was it called? Which one? Was Acro it the uh, meat eater? Yeah. What Acro was it called? Acrocanthosaurus. Acrocanthosaurus, um, yes. Did it have any predators at all? Did it have any predators? Likely. It likely had predators, right? Do, um, do animals come out full grown? No. No, right? You start off small, then you have to get bigger, right? So do you think, while maybe a full grown Acrocanthosaurus probably didn't have a lot of predators, what about the young Acrocanthosaurus? Oh. Hmm. Probably have to watch out for bigger, other meat eating dinosaurs out there, right? Maybe other Maybe even other Acrocanthosaurus too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe some full grown Acrocanthosaurus, but over here, It's very possible. It's very possible. Yes, sir. Um. Would any other animals that lived back then that wasn't dinosaurs that fight with a, uh, shot with a, uh, Acrocanthosaurus? I bet so. If, uh, you've got a hungry Acrocanthosaurus out there roaming around and it sees something smaller that it could possibly eat for a snack or for a meal, probably going to go after that, right? What's that other smaller animal going to do? Is it just going to go, okay, dinosaur, here, eat me? No. He's probably going to run, probably going to try to get away, fight if he has to, all of the above. That's, that's instinctual in us, right? What if they can smaller predator? What if it's a smaller predator and, it, and if it's trapped, it might fight? It might, it might. So what do y'all think Dinosaur Valley State Park looked like? 113 million years ago, well, the back when this was still mud and the dinosaurs were walking around. Well, probably no river. Probably no river, right? And no campsites. No campsites. <laughs> Unless the dinosaurs like to go camping. Maybe a taller tree. Maybe different. taller trees. Maybe different types of plants. Different types of plants. Definitely. You think they had the same photography? No, probably not. Probably not. You Maybe think that hill was here? No. Oh, definitely. No, that hill was not here. Back 113 million years ago, when these animals were walking the, walking the area and making their footprints, we were on the edge of a beach. Whoa. Yeah, specifically a mud flat right here. Hey guys, let's, let's keep the rocks out of the water, okay? Thank you. So this was a mud flat. Really, really flat area. Behind you guys would have been a, a start of a shallow inland sea that's about to break through the entire continent and move from the Gulf of Mexico up to the Arctic Ocean. It hasn't broken through quite yet. Quite yet. What was it called? Are you thinking Pangea? Yeah, Pangea. This is af much after Pangea. The continents are about at the same place that they are today, roughly. Uh, but we hadn't had that western interior sea wave break through quite yet. Behind me would have been a really dense forest. We're talking like Amazon rainforest density. And then right here specifically is that mud flat, that muddy, marshy intertidal zone. So intertidal, sometimes it's underwater, sometimes it's exposed. So these animals are using this mud flat as kind of a highway and byway. The large shore Poseidon, we have uh, evidence of these guys moving in dominant directions. In fact, not just single individuals, but what appear to be herds or groups of them moving in north south direction. And that was the orientation of the beach back 113 million years ago. Now, we don't really have the evidence of Acrocanthosaurus working in, in groups like that because their tracks are just every which way. But I argue that the lack of evidence is not evidence. So just because we don't have that evidence doesn't mean that they were wholly uh, individual hunters or individual dinosaurs. They may very well have been social animals. We just don't see that evidence here. What we do see evidence of, again, is Sora Poseidon being a social animal, moving in those groups. But what's even cooler is in those herds of footprints that we see, we see little juvenile tracks in the middle of those groups. Why do we see young Sorpicide in the middle of a group of adult Sorpicide? Um, yes, sir. Two. Um, she loves one because. Oh, of, go ahead. Because of th their babies probably went under them for protection. Uh, for protection, what were you gonna say? Uh, they have the adults have them in the middle, so that way. All right. 
Exactly. So think about modern day elephants, right? What do the elephants do with their babies when a hungry lion comes around? They put them in the middle. Put them in the middle, right? And the adults are on the outside. We see the same type of behavior based on the tracks here that Sora Poseidon does. Same thing. So they're social animals and they're taking care of their babies, right? See the same type of behavior. That's a big footprint. That's a big sore Poseidon footprint right here. Right here. And the other one. Right here. And that one right there. Yep, this one right here is an Acrocanthosaurus. It's got three big old claws on him. We've got another Acrocanthosaurus right here. Those are the two types of dinosaurs that we've got here, the main track size. Which one? This, this one. Yeah. This is the front footprint of Sauropocide. The front footprint. Uh, those, those back ones, they're just big sinkholes. Oh, awesome. I was waiting for someone to ask that. <laughs> I was waiting for it. Yeah, the great big holes over here, those are where tracks used to be. So long before we were apart, folks would come and chisel tracks out and sell them. In fact, uh, having grown up in this area, um, I can attest that I took these tracks for granted. They were everywhere. We would go to another state park and my very first question was, okay, where are the tracks? And mom and dad had to explain to me every single time. They're not here, they're just at, at our park. And I was like, why are we here? Well, I didn't understand why. I came to see dinosaur tracks every single time. But in this area, there are so many tracks that people didn't bat an eye about chiseling one out, especially during the depression. You know, already you can't find a job to earn money to provide food for your family, to provide shelter, to provide clothing for them. But what you've got is dinosaur everything at that time. You've got a supply of dinosaur footprints. So again, no one thought twice about chiseling the track out and selling on top of the road. You'd get about $25, $30 for a dinosaur track back then. You know, nothing to retire off of, but enough to get by until you found that next opportunity. We've got two, three thousand dollars in today's terms. So again, nothing to to retire off of, but just to get by until you found that next opportunity. What do you think people would do um, if they didn't have access to dinosaur tracks? Fake them. Exactly. There is so much limestone around here, and all these tracks are in limestone. It was. It did not take long before someone had the idea, well, I'm just going to chisel mine out and say, yep, that's the dinosaur track. In fact, that's how Roland T. Bird, the paleontologist who excavated the famous section of the trackway just about 100 foot up river, in fact, where those, the man the red shirt and his two kids are walking, that's the excavation site of Roland T. Bird. If you go up there, you can see two right angles cut out of the main track layer. You're not going to see a lot of tracks because he cut those out, but those two right angles of where tracks were cut out of. And you can see those now in the American Museum of Natural History up in New York City, or a little closer to home down in Austin outside the Texas Memorial Museum on the UT grounds. Um, those tracks were excavated in Roland by Roland T. Bird, and he actually came across uh, a chiseled out track that caught his eye, uh, but it wasn't actual chisel out track, it was a forged track that he found. Uh, Roland T. Bird was employed by a man named Barnum, who we might be familiar with. Yep, yep, he, same, he same circus man, he exactly. Found the trash oh, interesting, I did not know that one. I'll have to do some more research. But Mr. Barnum had employed Roland T. Bird to find him everything and anything dinosaur that he could. Well, he's on a search across the United States, specifically the southwestern area, finding dinosaur tracks, bones, whatever he can find. And he's actually on a roadside stop outside New Mexico, and he comes across this chiseled out dinosaur track. It's actually a forged track. Roland T. Bird has seen enough tracks at this time in his life where he's like, okay, that's a fake, that's a forgery, that's not how they actually come out. But he'd also seen enough tracks where he saw, well, yeah, that's a fake, but it's based on something that is real. So he got to talking with the guy at the roadside stand and learned about Glenrose. So Roland T. Bird putted his uh, model key down here all the way to find these tracks. And when he did, it kind of opened up this area 
to be known as Dinosaur Valley. Now, the locals knew about the tracks. Uh, the first official track was discovered in 1909 by a little boy playing hooky from school uh, in, a, in a creek down river. He found one of the first sets of uh, Acrocanthosaurus tracks. So, locals knew that they were here, but that was about as far as it went. It wasn't really until Roland T. Burke came down and had his massive excavation ordeal uh, summer week, summer long ordeal where it flooded multiple times trying to excavate these tracks that he was finally able to get them out and really make a name for Flint Rose as being the dinosaur capital of Texas. For those of y'all just getting here, y'all have any questions for me or those of y'all that been here with me? Um, do you follow the tracks to find skeletons? Oh, that's a great question. Do we follow the tracks to find skeletons? So when I find a track, the first thing I like to do is to figure out which direction the animal was moving, or at least pointing, facing. You know, maybe it was just standing still. When I find the track, I find, okay, so it's pointing this way. Well, if it's pointing this way, there's likely another track in front of it and behind it, right? So that helps me find a trail of the tracks. Now, does it find a trail to bones? We have not found any official dinosaur bones here in the park. Uh, but if you go about 8, 10 miles west here, you do find sore Poseidon bones. In fact, they found there's a, a quarry that they have now that uh, they found a bunch of sore Poseidon neck vertebrae. So a single neck vertebra of sore Poseidon was four foot long. In fact, when they found that, that vertebra, they thought it was initially uh, petrified wood because it was so huge and massive that they didn't think a singular bone, let alone a vertebra of a neck, would be four foot long. Can you, um, just one bone in its neck is as tall as you. That's incredible. That's incredible. But if we think too, how come there are bones back there and not bones that we found here? Well, let's think back to the environment. What was this area? Mudflat, right? That was intertidal mudflat. So we're on that beach. So let's assume that there is a meter or two of water, four to seven foot of water. And you've got an animal that comes and dies in this environment. What else lives in this environment that might take care of an animal that has just died? Are there other fish and stuff swimming around in the water? Yeah. Right? So maybe you've got all these animals coming and tearing at the carcass, spreading it apart. And or eating. More eating. You've got all these animals scavenging this area. Anyone ever seen like a time lapse of an animal that has died in the ocean, fall it sucking to the bottom, and all those animals just consume it, and by the end of the video, there's like nothing left? Same type, same type of stuff that was happening back then. So the environment just wasn't conducive to track, or excuse me, to fossil uh, bone preservation as it was to track preservation. Either. Just a very different environment. But again, back behind me was inland. And these animals were definitely moving inland as well. That's where we see their bones, but just not right here. Uh, interestingly enough, on the rock, large rock right behind you, ma'am. There is, I found that just last week, there is a bone in that rock. Now, I do not know if it's a dinosaur bone or what type of bone it is. It, that rock came from a time period uh, after these tracks were made. That one right there, yep, at the corner to your right. There is a little fragment of a bone in there. No, not with that one. Um, in fact, in the last year, we have found three bone fragments. Uh, I found one, uh, the, someone had thrown a, a big boulder, or a big basketball-sized rock, I shouldn't say boulder, into the main track site. When we do our regular cleanings of this area, I've taken it out, and it just so happened to crack when they threw it in there, and I was able to see where the bone was inside. I've got that in my office right now. Haven't been able to identify it. Uh, we had an intern this summer who found a much smaller piece 
a scrub rock, but still a little bone embedded in it as well. And then just last week, I happened to notice that one. I, mean, I can't believe I hadn't. I've walked past that one so many times over the past few years and hadn't noticed it. But it may not have been necessarily dinosaur bones because that rock uh, was like from probably from the area that y'all are standing on. So it's a much younger rock, and that rock represents a much deeper depositional environment. In fact, if you look at the rock that you're standing on, you can find all sorts of marine fossils like five owls, which are clams, oysters, mollusks. You can find sea snails that are called gastropods, all sorts of different fossils in this area that give you an idea of what the depositional environment was like. So all limestone is created at the bottom of an ocean. All limestone is created at the bottom of the ocean. And this particular environment right here probably represents, I'd say, 20 to 30 meters depth of water. The, the deepest water environment that we had here in the park is about 50 meters deep. And you can't see it from right here, but if you were to walk down to the end of the, that rock beach, there's the cliff, the limestone cliff right there. And that is a particular unit that represents the deepest water environment we have, about 50 meters deep. But that one's pretty cool because if anyone been to Big Rocks in Glen Rose? Uh, hmm? Well, Big Rocks is, is a city park there in Glen Rose, and it is exactly what it sounds. It's a bunch of big rocks uh, that have just been weathered in um, bus and car size round boulders. Kids love crawling around there. I just love this. I still kind of love it. Uh, but that's the same layer of rock. That's a Thorpe Springs member right there that you can follow from here all the way to Glen Rose in a deeper water environment and you can even go out west towards the little town of Pelosi, it's just a wide spot in the road, um, and see that same Thorpe Springs member. And if you were to really identify or really get in there and look at that rock, what you're seeing is way off in the west there's a lot more sand in that unit and it's not very consolidated or packed very hard. That's because that was more inland, and you got a lot more sand from the beach coming in to that layer. As you moved east, that was into the sea. And so the rocks that you've got in, uh, in Big Rocks Park, those are much more fine grained and much more consolidated than the ones you have over to the west. And if you look at the rocks here that we've got in the park, it's right in between. It's right a mix of the two. It's kind of a, a cross section of what this environment looked like 113 million, 100, 110, 113 million years ago when we were uh, both at a beach when the dinosaurs were walking around and then we would have been below the surface of the water moving up. It's crazy to wrap your head around, right? Yes, sir. They're not catching anything. They're showing us these tracks. Right? So you're exactly right. There's a bunch of microscopic organisms in the ocean. And they have microscopic little shells made of calcium. Limestone is calcium carbon, CaCO3. And when those calcium and carbon shells sink to the bottom of the ocean, after thousands of years and millions of years, they start to accumulate and you get the layers of rocks that we've got here, the layers of limestone. Are any other tracks? Yes, ma'am, there are hundreds, there are hundreds of tracks here in the park. Hold on, bud, I'll get right back to you, okay? There are hundreds of tracks here in the park. This is the main track side, it's the most easily accessible track side that we've got. It's the one that we keep roped off so that it's easily viewable as well. But all the tracks are within the confines of the river. Um, I would recommend heading up to the ballroom track site. That's a little over a uh, quarter of a mile up there. Um, but you've got about two foot of water in there, so if you're willing to get your feet wet, that's the place to go, but there are hundreds of tracks in just that one track side alone. Um, but I recommend if you're looking for tracks, go early in the morning before everyone gets in the water and turns the water up. And at that point, you just can't see the tracks. And it's very bad. But we have a lot of tracks, but so they're all within the confines of the river. Yes, sir. This has like right, right here looks like it has four toes. Looks like it's got four toes? 
Look, when you step, every single step that you take is in a perfect footprint, right? Sometimes only a couple of digits are imprinted. Sometimes all of your or your, all of your digits are imprinted. Sometimes if it if the mud's pretty hard already, maybe you don't leave a track at all, right? Maybe he was hopping, right? Who's old? His foot hurt. Happens to us all. <laughs> the animals that made these tracks, about what period did they come to us? That's early to mid Cretaceous. Uh, we date the main track layer at about 113 million years old. Now, we do have a couple different track layers here in the park. This is, represents the oldest layers that we've got. Uh, there are some that are stratigraphically higher. Up, if you go all the way up over past uh, the ballroom track site to the Taylor track site, those are stratigraphically higher and therefore younger. We don't have the exact time frame on there, but I would I would guess probably five to ten million years within that range. Yes, sir. How is Jason? Are we talking dinosaurs? That's a great question. That's a great question. I would I would say that they are as intelligent as the animals that we have in the day. Like they're definitely as dynamic. They move just as much as the animals that we have today. And we're probably doing the same job intelligence wise as a lot of the animals today. So some animals are gonna be smarter, right? Some animals not so much. I think you're gonna have that broad spectrum of intelligence for the dinosaurs just as we do today in our little universe. Somebody's gotta That's right, exactly. Someone's gotta eat and someone's gotta be eaten. Was a layer of rock removed to find these? So this was naturally excavated okay. by the river, uh, barring <clears throat> the, the large excavation sites that we have here. Sure. But it would have been eroded initially by the river. Okay. We don't do any active excavation here in the park. Um, we are, are letting nature do its course. So that's kind of the cool thing. There are tracks where, when I first got here, half of the ballroom track site was covered up by sediment and debris. And then we had a flood come in and took away a lot of that sediment. I was able to get a lot more track, but it deposited on other tracks. So it's a cycle of what is exposed with the different floods, and it's a cycle of when it is finally exposed. It's really just a finite timeline until that track is completely gone. Yeah. So we're pretty lucky to be able to I see have these tracks today. Car, you know, if we were here uh, just over 100 years ago, these tracks wouldn't be exposed yet. And if we were here 100 years in the future, the tracks that we're seeing now likely won't be here. But fear not. Um, we have more tracks. In fact, there are tracks under your feet right now. They just haven't been exposed yet. They're under a couple feet uh, of rock and sediment. But as these, as the river flows and floods, these tracks will be eroded away, eroding off the, the layers that you're standing on and reveal new tracks. I think new tracks. They're still 130 million year old, but they're new to us. Exactly. Yes, sir. Do you think uh, dinosaur, uh, dinosaurs of other things work with others? Oh, do you th I think there was cooperation between the two species? Yes. Probably. Uh, there are things no. called symbiotic relationships, mutualistic relationships, where both animals can benefit from each other, or sometimes there's parasitic relationships where it's just one organism that's benefiting from the relationship. I imagine these types of relationships, just like they are today, were back then too. Good question. So dinosaurs are a lot like our animals today? I would, I would think in many ways they're a lot like the animals today, and in many ways they're not, right? We can compare and contrast them in so many different aspects. Good question, y'all. Well, y'all, I appreciate y'all coming out here and talking some dinosaurs with me. You guys had some great questions. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. One more question. Sure. 
Do you think dinosaurs could use like trees and logs for stuff? Do I think they could use trees and logs like as tools or for hey, to use for homes? Uh, if they could use them for like uh, a dam. Oh, for like dams? And stuff like that. Ooh. It's possible. It's very possible. Kind of like the beaver uses trees to dam things, dam streams up. So they have the complete power to chunk down a tree and then like put it in the river. They do. They've got that power. Absolutely. But just because you have the power doesn't necessarily mean you'll use it that way, right? I think they will chunk down a tree. That may have been a shit. Yeah, if you had to, if you were running for your life, you'd probably follow through anything that was in front of you, especially if you weighed 44 tons and were six feet tall. So this is the main track out here in the park, but we have hundreds of tracks elsewhere. They're all within the confines of the river, and they're the vast majority are within this track layer. So this. This track layer extends more or less horizontally out in every direction. Yeah. So if you keep that in mind, it's a lot easier to find the tracks. Um, in fact, if you look upriver, on each side of the river, you can see a lighter shade of green. Yeah. That lighter shade of green is where the main track tide is exposed, or excuse me, main track layer is exposed. So there are dinosaur tracks in, in that layer of rock between here and the folks on the little sandy beach up there. And when you're looking for tracks, look for regularly spaced patches of vegetation or shadows. That regular spacing is likely the animal's track way. Um, and then, once you find a track, get in there with your hands and really feel around. Because again, sediment likes to accumulate in there. And there's so much detail in these tracks that is covered up by the sediment that our eyes can't see but our hands can see when we get down in the field there. Uh, these are world-class tracks. So you can get down in there and you can feel the curvature of the animal's foot. You can feel the foot pad. Uh, you can feel where the claw came out of the foot. All sorts of detail that you can feel in these, these tracks that your eyes can see, or excuse me, your hands can see, but your eyes just can't. Yes, sir. Hey, you're see you really this one more. Do we have any idea of what color, what red dinosaurs would have green We don't have, uh, we have all sorts of ideas what they would look like, but we don't have any evidence that we found so that we can definitively say this is it. Now, they have found some feathers of the older or younger, younger dinosaurs. dinosaurs. Uh, that showed a bit of coloration in there. There are natural colors, a lot like the colors of the animals today. But they could have been pink, purple. We don't know. My guess is most of them were kind of an ugly thing. Yeah? Well, there's a, a huge variety of coloration in animals today. Think about the animals that blend in with camouflage. Reptiles. Now think about the animals that stand out. What about like a skunk? Those kind of stand out, right? What about that big white stripe down their back? Yeah, that also blends in with grass. See, in my mind, that says, hey, watch out for me. I'm a skunk, I'm stinky. What about like the really brightly colored frogs in the rainforest that are poisonous? Those bright colors say, watch out for me, you don't want to eat me. So sometimes coloration can say, be careful, watch out. And sometimes coloration can say, I just want to blend in. I don't want, want to be seen, right? Coloration can do a lot of different things. But I imagine some animals, dinosaurs, would blend in to their environment and other dinosaurs would probably stand out. Yes, sir. Go for it. Well, all right. Probably. Probably. I bet the dinosaurs are doing the same thing that modern animals are doing. Getting hungry, finding food, taking care of their young, right? 
Water party right now. Let's all drink some water. Mine's flavored. 